Bismillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah my dear brothers and my sisters assalamu alaikum warahmatullah I received a question from a brother inquiring about the meaning of a few ayat in surah An-Nisa this ayat that he asked about were from the ayah 46 to 48 but uh, I want to put an introduction before going through this ayat Because when we read Al-Quran, we must look at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a completely different angle from that which we take when we look at other issues, either hadith or any other matter when it comes to that. When we want to study Al-Quran, we really should sit down and look at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a matter to study, not just read to collect uh, rewards or anything of that matter. It's just we have to make sure that when we sit, it is to derive wisdom, to derive teachings, and then go around and apply these uh, points that we have gained. The very first thing that I want to speak about here when you read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to pay specific attention to the title of the surah. Here is the surah An-Nisa. And as I said before studying the content of the three suggested ayat, I want to pinpoint to a few extremely important matters when it comes to speaking about Al-Quran. Point number one, there are no chapters and no verses in Al-Quran. This is a widely spread mistake that a lot of English speaking people make when they refer to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In so many times I see somebody written chapter or CH4 verses 3 and 4. And let me tell you something, the chapters and the verses are in either poetry, books or the Bible. Al-Quran Al-Karim has got in it something called a surah. A surah contains many ayat. And the ayat are the particles where there is number one, two, three, four, five. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls these, uh, what uh, groups, uh, the ayat, a surah. When he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, suratun anzalnaha wa faradunaha, like in surah An-Nur. Or uh, in another surah he says, wa idha unzilat suratun an aminu billah. This is in surah At-Tawbah. Ayah 86. So as you can see here, I see surah. But what does the term surah mean? It comes from the word sur, and the sur is the wall that surrounds a garden. The ayat is a group of ayat, and they all deal with different subjects, and that surah or the wall unites them all to work on one singular purpose. Like here, number four, it's surah an-nisa. This is one thing. The number two, there is no English Quran. It's only the translation or a potential translation of a meaning from the Quran. As Ali radiallahu anhu says that Al-Quran hamal, i.e. Al-Quran can have more than a meaning. It really depends on the context on how you use Al-Quran. You can virtually derive an infinity of meanings. This is why in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَنَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَ أَن تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَدًا Say, if the oceans were ink, and in another uh, surah also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and you take the trees as bands and you write, you would never, ever, cover the whole of the Qur'an, even if you use the oceans and seven times the amount of ink. So as you can see here, that the Qur'an doesn't have. So what we got here in English, it's not the Qur'an in English, and it certainly is not the translation of the Qur'an in English. All it is, is this. That there is a potential meaning in Al-Qur'an, And that potential meaning has been translated into English to facilitate the understanding of the few of what is in those surat or these ayat. That's why when people translate the meanings of the Quran and they write this is a Quran, such is a major sin. This is a lie. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran when he explicitly mentions and threatens people who do this evil act, i.e., Translate the Quran in English and then call the translation as Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ So the extreme punishment and a threat to those who write the book with their hands. 
ثم يقولون هذا من عند الله then they say this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exactly what people do today is they write the English uh, versions and they call them it's a Quran chapter this verse that to the English speaking person out there they do not make a difference to them this is Quran and it is in English and obviously as you can see this is absolutely untrue therefore and as a consequence to this my dear brothers and my sisters whenever you mention the meanings of Quran in English make sure that the listener right in front of you knows that you are mentioning a translation not the Quran per se because sometimes you say something in English and say this is the Quran and the English is extremely poor and you can imagine it's just like here in the West now in the Christian world and the Jewish world when they recite the Bible in English to them the Bible is in English when in fact it is not but anyway when you look in the, or when you take point number three now in studying the Quran you want to make sure that you understand that every time you read one ayah in Al Quran that ayah really has one of the different entities that I'm going to mention now. It's either a report where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reports to us a historical or futuristic or a hidden revelation. It's just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about something. Number two, it could be a fact. Obvious like death, food, sleep, uh, children, uh, trees. So it's a fact that is in life. And also sometimes the ayah has a command in it, do and don't. Sometimes it is a statement where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supports the truth or if it's a lie or something of that ilk. And sometimes the ayah is just a pure teaching. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from fornication, from drinking wine, or teaches us about how to educate the kids and things like that. As such, to really understand an ayah or a group of ayat in Al-Qur'an that deal with a topic, we must at all times not isolate the ayat, but rather study them in the big picture as a context. Such as, for example, we look at the position of the ayah that we want to study in the Qur'an as a whole, then where it is in the surah. For example, like here, we are going to see about Surah Al-Nisa. So we understand that these ayat, the four or five ayat that we are going to study today, they are in Surah Al-Nisa. So the very first thing that we got to do is look at the position of this ayat. Where exactly are they? Which topic comes before that? And which topic comes after them? And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this particular ayat here? More than so, you'll find that there is a great hint in where the ayat is is and they help us inshallah understand what it is that they carry this is number one number two it's the interrelationship between this ayat themselves and what it comes before and after each ayah number three the topic that they deal with and bear in mind here that there is either a general or a specific topic that they are dealing with and we gotta have an understanding an idea about that general topic to be able to understand what the particulars of that ayah or the wordings mean when we deal with that general topic number four the choice of words when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a word in al-quran it is meant that are not synonyms and all these things in the quran so when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses wine and uses alcohol these are two different words and each one of them has got a meaning that if we exchanged the position of these two words there be a problem in the book of Allah and billah, there are no problems at all so we gotta make sure that the choice of words and how it is in the Quran plays a specific role the other day somebody wrote to me a, an essay everything in it is in English and he says this is evidence and I refused the whole essay I said to him it's either you bring the evidences in Arabic or we cannot have a debate about a point which I will uh, highlight later. And this is a great mistake that a lot of people make. They call themselves seekers of knowledge and they don't speak Arabic. And then they bring translations of what other people have understood and translated. And they use these arguments 
to derive so many rulings, and this is absolutely dangerous, and this is just like so Christian-like, billah. And also the meaning. So be, we, when we find a word in Al-Quran, we must first and before anything see what that meaning means in Al-Quran, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already explained what that meaning is. Is for example when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the water. The, so here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we know it's the rain. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the human creation, so we know he speaks about sperm. And then when he speaks about the water of the sea, we see ma al bahar, so it's the water in the ocean. So here you can see the term water has got three meanings: the rain, the water of the sea. And the sperm of the person. So we really need first before calling on to dictionaries and tafsirs on whatever it is out there. We want to make sure first what the Quran says about any word before borrowing from external sources. My dear brothers and my sisters. We must at all times when we read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep in mind the name of the surah that we are studying. When studying an, any ayat, either 1, 2, or 10, or 15 from any surah, we have to keep the title of the surah in mind as all the ayat work together to serve the title. Just like a movie title or a book or anything, all scenes, though different, and with different actors and dialogues and everything, they all serve the title. And the title gives a general idea about the topic discussed. And the Quran is not different at all. So we got to look at the surah, the title of it, where it was delivered or revealed. Is it in Mecca or al Madina? The Quran in Mecca didn't have commands. The one in al Madina had commands. And so on and so forth. So we got to make sure that we understand few particularities about the surah or the ayat before we go and derive any rulings from that. For example, let me tell you something. The characteristics of the surah. And here we're going to look at the surah An-Nisa. When you look to surah An-Nisa, there is something really strange about it. In all the books, and as it is known to everyone in the West here, that Surah An-Nisa, the title itself is translated to the Surah of the Women. And this is Surah number four. So you have Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, then comes Surah An-Nisa. In any translation of the Quran, they will tell you it is the Surah of the Women. But I will come back to the title, and you're going to be surprised for that. So the first thing to know is that Surah An-Nisa was revealed in al Madina, So it will have lots of commands. Number two, it was revealed after Al-Mumtahana or Al-Mumtahina. It can be read in two ways, and this is the tested. And uh, it was also revealed before Al-Zalzala. So it was revealed between the two, Al-Mumtahina or Al-Mumtahana and Surah Al-Zalzala. Al-Mumtahina is in al Madina as well, but Al-Zalzala is in Mecca. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, أول ما نزل بالمدينة, the very first of what has been revealed in al Madina, سورة البقرة. سورة البقرة, even though in Al-Quran is number two, but in the order of revelation it is number 87. And then after سورة البقرة came سورة الأنفال. After سورة الأنفال came آل عمران. Then سورة الأحزاب. Then Al-Mumtahina or Al-Mumtahana, then Surah Al-Nisa. And then after that, Al-Zalzala was in the book. But Al-Zalzala, as I said, was revealed way before Al-Nisa. The title of Surah Al-Nisa. Generally speaking, the fourth Surah, as I said, in the book of Allah is referred to as Surah Al-Nisa. Widely translated as the women. But is this really the true meaning of the word Nisa? Well, actually, it's not. The word Al-Nisa doesn't have a singular form. They say usually An-Nisa is this plural of Imra'ah. But that is not true. Because when you look in Al-Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about An-Nisa, in Surah Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ also in Surah Al-Ahzab and Surah Al-Nur, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, يَا نِسَاء النَّبِي and here, my dear brothers and my sisters, you must understand what this title, An-Nisa, means. Is it the women? 
Look at this here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the sort of tawbah says, إِنَّمَا النَّسِيءُ زِيَادَةٌ فِي الْكُفْرِ The Arabs had an evil practice when they wanted, you know, we have four months that we cannot fight in. ذِي الْقَادَ ذِي الْحِجَّةِ مُحَرَّمْ and رَجَبْ These are the four sacred months. The Arabs before what they used to do before pre-Islam, if they wanted to fight, say, in ذِي الْقَادَ ذِي الْقَادَ is a sacred month, usually they cannot. So they will bring somebody and he, that person there, would say, I am going to replace Dil Qada by, for example, yeah, Rabi'ul Awwal. And I am going to defer Dil Qada till Rabi'ul Awwal. So what happens is the two months get exchanged and the battles take place and the Arabs would fight. So here, an nasi it has two components to it. Number one is the delay and number two is Addition. That's why when you say nasaytu, it's when you forget because it has been delayed and you have added something that you should be doing now to the near future. Surat al-Nisa is very interesting when you look at it from this meaning here. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean women? And as I said, no, it doesn't mean meaning. Al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith قال أن this حديث is in البخاري and Muslim من سره أن يبسط له في رزقه whoever would like to be pleased to increase in his provision أو ينسى له في أثره or his life be prolonged should maintain good ties with his blood relations and this is in البخاري and Muslim and here ينسى is what I want to concentrate on ينسى and this means here that Again, it's to defer and change uh, and add to that word there. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks, we have to pay attention to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And it is translated, Wives of the Prophet, you are not like anyone else from the other women of this world. And in another surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about the beauty, he says, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا لِبُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَائِهِنَّ And that they should not expose their adornments except to their partners or their fathers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a few people that the woman shouldn't reveal themselves to. And then he say, أَوْ بَنِي أَخَوَاتِهِنَّ أَوْ نِسَائِهِنَّ or to their sister's son, or nisa'ihin, and in the translation in English, subhanAllah, they wrongly translated into their women. How can a woman not reveal her beauty to her woman? But here, nisa'ihinna, what it means is anyone of those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that are prohibited. For example, you as my sister, you can show your beauty to your husband, to your brother, to your father, to your sister. Now when your sister marries, she will have a progeny. And when that progeny marries, they will have a progeny. Let's say you have 20 generations. Those 20 generations, they can see you without the hijab. That's what nisa'ihinna, i.e. those generations that are delayed and they will come later on. These are the ones also that are exempted from the prohibition. So the surat an-nisa doesn't mean the women, but what it means is all those that relate to the female world, all the laws that relate to the female world, they are going to be mentioned in surah number four, and that is an-nisa. So it's not about the women, it's more so about what is to follow you. Today, tomorrow, after tomorrow, that's why you have all these laws that are about the marriage, that is about inheritance, there is orphans, there is all these things. These are matters that relate to the ladies. Again, as I said, this is like a very simple introduction. Otherwise, inshallah, we'll talk about this at some other time. Again, to truly understand or at least gather a deep understanding of what a potential meaning from an ayah or a group of ayat is, you need to trace back until you find the beginning of the topic discussed. For example, although the question that the brother has asked is about ayah from 46 to 48. But speaking about these three ayat won't be possible because they are right at the heart of the topic. So to be able to understand and explain this topic, 
I had to trace back the ayat until I got to the head of the ayah and that was the ayah number 43 so I had to go four ayat before that ayah 43 talks about approaching salat and uh, while in a state of drunkenness then about the state of physical impurity the, due to sex then uh, about how to do in case we don't have water how we do the dry ablution at tayammum so that is ayah number 43 but here, as we see, number 46 and 48 speak about the Jews. So I looked back again, and the Ayah 44 opens the gateway to, the, uh, the, to this topic here at hand. First and foremost, let's see what the general translation of the whole text means. I.e., if you took the translation of the meanings of the Qur'an, and you read them, what would they uh, say to you? What would you get out of it? And uh, I'm going to use here the Sahih International. And just a small introduction that this Sahih Intru uh, International was done in 1997 where three American ladies embraced Islam. And uh, it is them that they worked in the translation of the meanings. And this book was, or this version of the translation of the meanings of the Quran was printed by Dar Abu Qasim Publishing in Saudi Arabia. And I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you don't trust this or any other English translation because there are calamities in the translations. Always remember, those people are good in English. They are not good in, in understanding Al-Quran. And to tell you the truth, my dear brothers and my sisters, Al-Quran, to really get the meanings of Al-Quran, you need linguistics, mathematicians, you need ge geography, history, medicines, topography. You need a gazillion uh, number of scholars to really help you get the meanings of an ayah. So when someone like this, you have three American ladies, Allah knows what they were before embracing Islam. And uh, it's funny today, just somebody embraces Islam, they go, he study three years and then becomes a sheikh. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But in any case, let's see what the meanings of this uh, translation. I will uh, first read the English and then we go through the Arabic to get a good idea about the whole meaning. It says in the uh, meaning of the English, Have you not seen those who were given a portion of the scripture, purchasing error in exchange for it, and wishing you would lose the way. This is number 44. So it's a Surat Al-Nisa, number 4, and Ayah 44. And Allah is most knowing of your enemies. And sufficient is Allah and an ally. And sufficient is Allah as a helper. This is number 45. 46. Among the Jews are those who distort words from their proper usage. And say, we hear and disobey and hear. But be not heard. And ra'ina. They couldn't find the translation for this word, so they just wrote it ra'ina. Twisting their tongues and defaming their religion. And if they had said, instead, we hear and obey and wait for us to understand, it would have been better for them and more suitable. But Allah has cursed them for their disbelief, so they believe not except for a few. And then ayah 47 O oh, you who were given the scripture, believe in what we have sent down to Muhammad, confirming that which is with you. Before we obliterate faces and turn them toward their backs or curse them as we curse the Sabbath breakers. And ever is the decree of Allah accomplished. Number 48. Indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah has certainly fabricated a tremendous sin. So as you can see here, this is the five ayat as a whole context. But you've read them and they actually don't mean much. It's just words to you. To really understand Al-Quran, as I have already spoken, you need to dig in deep inside. Any ayah that you want to study about Al-Quran has three time Fulfillment. It speaks about the past, and from the past you derive experiences, what has happened to other people, and then you apply that past, whatever you derive from it, in today's lives, and you can also apply it to the future as a protection means, 
or as an encouragement means. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Fir'aun, what he did with Musa. This is a historical fact that took place 5,000, 6,000 years ago. So we see what Fir'aun has done and how he disobeyed. So from me, I, what is the message to me is that whatever Fir'aun did 6,000 years ago is still relevant today and I shouldn't do it. What this means is I don't do it today so I don't get what Fir'aun had and I also make sure I don't plan to do it or I don't do it or I learn from it and prevent it for the future. So this is exactly, it, it really, every ayah works with the past, with now, with the future. So here, the English text says things that have happened in the past, and we understand words, but we actually cannot relate to them today. And the Quran, you must relate every ayah that you read, must fulfill now and the future. So let us now go beyond the sounding of words, and derive something that can benefit us about the past, i.e. learn what the Jews did, and also learn where they went wrong so that we avoid it now, i.e. the present, and then use it as a blueprint for the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts this ayah with, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا نَصِيبًا مِنَ الْكِتَابِ don't you see? And here, don't you see, has got two meanings. One of them is visual, and the other one spiritual. It's like with your mind's eyes. Alam tara. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that have you not seen of those people that were given a portion from the book, from the scripture? Until now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not spoken about whom is he talking. Is he talking about the Jews? Is he talking about the Christians? Or is he talking about the Muslims? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena utu al-kitab, or Ya ahl al-kitab, he always speaks about the three religions, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. We are always part of that. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara ila alladheena utu nasiban min al-kitab. We Muslims are included here. So are the Jews and so are the Christians. So what, they are given the book. So were they supposed to be doing something with the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them? So yes, they are supposed to be guided and using that book for the purpose for which it was revealed. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing here in the Quran, he is communicating to us something. And uh, as I said earlier on, the speech is about those who have received the book. Utu nasiban, a share, a portion of the book. And this, what it means is, as the Jews and the Christians have received the, the Torah and the gospel, but what has reached them is a portion of that, not the full content of it. Or some people instead of speaking about having a whole idea about a whole topic, they only have a portion of knowledge about a topic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us not to speak unless you have a full understanding about the full topic or stick to what you got, just like the Jews didn't have a whole of what has been revealed to Musa alayhi salam, and as such, they did not act upon the guidance that was sent to them. Those people were given the scripture, and a good share of it, but what's left of that scripture has been enough to make them realize that the truth was there, i.e. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and that they should follow it. But what did they do with that divine gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them? They used it as a currency, and what they did buy with it was misguidance. What this means is extremely dangerous. Al-Quran is a beautiful book that is supposed to take us to Jannah should we practice it properly, right? Now, if I get the Quran, I learn the Quran just to get a job. And then when I got the job, I start using the teachings of Al-Quran so that I become rich. This dunya here, whatever I do here compared to Al-Jannah, I am a loser. So what I am doing here, I am using the Qur'an and Islam as a currency, and I am buying this life, but selling my hereafter, waliyadu billah, to punishment. The strangest thing is that these people, i.e. the people of the book, aren't totally strangers to the heavenly laws, the Jews and Christians. 
They believe in the last day, the qiyamah, the malaika, the angels, the decree, Allah. They believe in so many things like us Muslims. Yet, even though in their own belief, they firmly believe that they are following the right path, but what is right to them is a misguidance to us. But they can't see it. The Jews and the Christians, they see that until today they are following the guidance. But they can't see beyond the books that they got. And many of them, if they looked in the Quran properly, they would find so many things that they already got in the books, their books, i.e. the Torah and the Gospel, and they would know that they are actually, Al-Islam is not that much of a difference between them. And then what they did is that they did their very best to turn people away from what they got. And this is where the missionaries come in, is they turn Muslims away from this al-Islam. Because the Jews and the Christian, well not much the Jews, but the Christian, believe that what they are following is as-sirat al-mustaqim, is the straight path. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they might decorate what they preach to you, but deep inside they are your enemies. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah 45, Wallahu a'lamu bi'a'da'ikum. Because in their quest to misguide us, they will resort to any tricks to make us believe that they are our allies and friends and well wishes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reassures us that he is the most knowledgeable of who our enemies are. And uh, he tells us, so why should you accept what they say? And why don't you accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? And uh, then he gives us the two most important things that a Muslim can hope for is that Allah be his ally and also be our support. I.e. anything that happens to us, we straightway turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our ally and also as our support to help us win against what's happening today. This is also a very dangerous equation because if we do not accept and seriously acknowledge Allah's ultimate knowledge and act on it, he won't be our close ally nor our primary support and uh, here the choice is absolutely ours. Do we want Allah to be with us or not? And the problem you see today, look at the world around us. Everybody hates Muslims. Everybody's banging us. And we make a lot of the, Ya Allah support us, Ya Allah help us. But nothing much is happening. It's because deep inside us, we are not convinced that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows very well of who our enemies are. And this is why we see Muslims and our government and our scholars and everybody is rubbing into something, following something, doing something. And many, many of us are doing things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explicitly in the Quran or in the Sunnah forbade us from doing. But in any case... So now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established a misguiding act that the people of the book play with all evil and after reassuring us of where he is and how, how we can gain his alliance and his support and his relationship with us, he goes one more and more precise and specific step to tell us more and reveal more to us about this very interesting fact. And before going a step further, until now Allah speaks about the people of the book which could be Muslim, Jewish, and Christian. But now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the topic to a new level, to a new reality. He's going to tell us about a group of people that are expert in working in some peculiar and strange manner. He tells us about al-ladhina hadu, min al-ladhina hadu. He didn't say al-Yahud, he didn't say the children of Israel. He didn't say the people of the book. He says, الَّذِينَ هَادُوا So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want with this term? What did he say of the children of Israel? مِنَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا Well, as it turns out, الَّذِينَ هَادُوا This is to remind the children of Israel with something they have already gone through. When Musa alayhi salam crossed the sea, and Fir'aun got drowned, and the children of Israel saw with their bare eyes the end of Fir'aun. 
after they walked for some time and they saw a people worshiping an idol and they turned to Musa alayhi salam wa qawli ya Musa ij'alana aliha kama lahum aliha give us a goddess or a deity or an idol to worship just like they, they have Musa alayhi salam got angry and you all remember when Musa alayhi salam left his brother Harun with the children of Israel and he went for the 40 days meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did the children of Israel do at that time? They, or a Samiri, what he did, he created to them a calf. And then they started worshiping the calf. 40 days later, when Musa alayhi salam came with the tablets of the Torah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him about what the children of Israel had done, Musa went back extremely angry. And you know the story where he held his brother's beard and uh, anyway. And then, what Musa salam did on the command of Allah is he took 70 of the best pious people of the Bani Israel, of the children of Israel, and they went to the miqat of Allah to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused these children of Israel, the 70 of them, to die. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them a life. And it is at that moment there when Musa alayhi salam says, وَأَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَا حَسَنَا إِنَّا هُدْنَا إِلَيْكَ i.e. we have repented. عُدْنَا يَأْتُبْنَا إِلَيْكَ i.e. Ya Allah, we have made a tawbah. Al-Yahud, it means those, Ya'ud, Yahud, i.e. those who have made repentance. This is what we call, it's the Jews, it's translated into English. But the Yahud, the meaning of the word Yahud, i.e. those who have have repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them min al hadu, i.e. of those, there is a portion from those who have repented to Allah. So Allah is reminding them with a state that you won't sin the big deal and you repented to me and I forgive you. So why are you behaving like this? So but in any way, so what these people have uh, done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمَّ وَاضِعِهِ Al-kalim is the, uh, the plural of kalima, of one single word, but what it means here is al-wahi, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which in their time is the Torah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks here about the books that they had in hand, the Torah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمَّ وَاضِعِهِ the harifun and the falsify or forge. I will tell you a bunch of words that all work with these with this very particular word. You harif. It's to forge, misstate, temper with, change, miscoat, dress up, funny up, fake up, doctor up, contort, distort, and deceive. So as you can see, they use all these different meanings and you get the idea that they played with the texts that were revealed unto them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَمَّ وَاضِعِهِ Away from their intended placements. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade alcohol, wine. They would change wine and they put, for example, orange juice. I'm just giving an example here. Or for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits for them uh, eating uh, the meat of uh, lions, they put, he forbade us to eat the, the meat of a, a lamb. I'm not saying that they exist, but this is how they played with the, their texts. And this evil act is both for physical meanings, like, like change the words, instead of day they put the night, all the meanings, and this is also very dangerous, where they play with the meanings of the words as if, we Muslims, we do that a lot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll give you just an example so that you see how we Muslims have become just like the Jews here where we play and we, we distort the meanings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about al-hajj. He says, al-hajj ashhurun ma'lumat. Al-hajj is well-known months with an S at the end. These are, i.e., al-hajj takes place in different months throughout the year, which are the four months. So we Muslims, when is our hajj? Our hajj is only in the, ten, the, in the five days in the hijjah. So what happens to the other months where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al-Quran explicitly says, Al-Hajj ashhurun ma'lumat. Nobody knows and nobody asks the question. So now hajj has become few days for us. What has happened with the rest of it? Allah knows more. But in any case, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in another surah threatened those who do this. He says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابِ 
a big threat of punishment to those who write the book or the scripture with their hands. ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Then they say, this is from Allah. And this is where the danger for the English translations. People write with their own hands meanings from the Qur'an and then they say, this is the Qur'an. Woe unto them, woe unto them. There is a huge curse and a great promise of punishment. Please do not do that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says, مِنَ الَّذِينَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ It's not all the Jews, but there is a portion of them. Just like us, there are some of our scholars that are also doing exactly what the Jews have done. They change the meanings of the hadith, they play with the text, and they write and they do that. And I will cover, inshallah, this topic some other time. And when these people are spoken to, or they are reminded... Or put face to face with the unchanged commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you put the children of Israel or Muslims today that are playing with the text of Islam. When you put them face to face with the reality, what they say, they say, Sami'na, we have heard. You're giving me dawah, you're reminding me, yes, I have heard. But do they actually follow the guidance, fadhakir? And remind because the dhikra, the reminding, will benefit the believers who follow the reminding what they do. But they say, Wa They listen with their ears and they disobey with their actions. And you can see this a lot in the Muslim world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in this one here, He tells us about how humans are. They listen. But they deliberately do not act. They don't want to show that they are disrespectful to Rasulullah at that time or impolite to him. But the Jews, you know, at the time of Rasulullah, just like today, uh, Muslims, even between us Muslims today, if we speak, I personally, uh, I have been abused so many times by Muslims themselves. I've been called coward, I've been called, you name it, and it's been. Why is that? It's just because when you tell somebody when they are doing something, and you tell them, okay, fear Allah, they get on your case. They hear what you are saying, but it gets to them and they get angry and they get all, who are you to tell me? What are you? Are you accusing me? And then they get on your case and they start insulting you. But the Jews at the time of Rasulullah had a different technique. What they used to do to Rasulullah, they used to insult him by direct, but indirectly, using words where it was impossible to anyone to hold them to it. Because as soon as you tell them, that is not, they say, no, we didn't mean that, we meant something else. What they were saying at that time, to Rasulullah Sallam, they were saying this, قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا We've heard. وَعَصَيْنَا And we have disobeyed, and then they say, وَاسْمَعْ غَيْرَ مُسْمَعْ وَرَاعِنَا لَيَّمْ بِأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ So what they say, وَاللَّهِ الْعَظِيمُ لَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ رَاعِنَا in Arabic, could mean, has two meanings. One of them is wait for us. And the second one comes from ar-ra'wana. And that is crazy. Crazy as in cuckoo or a train has jumped off the rack. Like completely crazy. You've lost it. Insane. Okay. So what the Jews used to do at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they heard the teachings of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would with their ears say, we've heard ya Muhammad. Yes, we've heard that. Behavior wise, they say, we disobey. We don't want to do that. And then when they want to talk to him, they go, Ya Muhammad, Asma, listen from us. What they mean, Ra'ina, is the following the typical words. So the word Ra'ina, as I said, has got two meanings. One of them is wait for us, and the other one more of the crazy type. Here are a few words that give you an idea of what they meant when they said Ra'ina. Insane, so it's like telling him, Ya Muhammad, you are insane or mad. Nuts, wacky, lunatics, psycho, barmy, bonkers, delirious, deranged, idiotic, mental, imbalanced, of unsound mind. So you can see they are all big insults. But no one could point them. No one could catch them. Because as I said, Ra'ina meant also wait for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how did we know that they were insulting him? Because Allah says, لَيَّمْ بِأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ twisting their tongues and they did that وطعنن في الدين accusing the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent our prophet with sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us ولو أنهم قالوا and if 
instead of insulting him, they said, Sami'na wa atana. We've listened to you, Muhammad, and we obey. Wasma, and listen to us, wanthurna, and wait for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced the term ra'ina, which, which could be taken from different meanings, to unthurna, which only means wait for us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, lakana khayran lahum. That would have been best and very good for them, wa aqwam, and more suitable to address a messenger. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they did what they did and they insulted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed them and they chased them away from his mercy because of their disbelief and the majority of them will not believe except a small tiny minority and these are the people that embraced Islam at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina utul kitab. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the children of Israel. Aminu bima anzalna musaddiqan lima ma'akum. Believe in Al-Qur'an that we have revealed and this Al-Qur'an supports already what you got with you other is the Torah and also correct some of what they had changed and misplaced and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says min qabli an natmisa wujuhan and that is on the day of the qiyamah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it is in Surah Al-Rahman where people are taken and thrown in hellfire here and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says or we will curse them just like we did with the people of uh, Saturday, except. And the story of the Saturday, you go on YouTube to my uh, Islam pep talk channel, and there is a whole talk about the story there in two parts about the people of the Sabbath and what they did, and you will find a great deal of information uh, there. But uh, generally, these people have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah turned them into pigs and monkeys. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا And whatever Allah decrees to happen shall take place and no one can stop that. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ It is certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive any association to him. You want to make sure that you put 1,000 lines under the word yushrak. A shirk is to share, associate. For example, if, if you are in your car by yourself, that's fine. If you, or if you buy the car by yourself, that's your car, you do with it what you want. But if somebody else shares in, in the purchase of the car, then you do not have a full control of the car because you just don't own it all. In the acts of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when people worship Allah, alhamdulillah, no shirk is, but as soon as people add another element into their worship, then their worship is no longer for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and Allah will not accept that he be associated willfully, like someone does it, and on purpose. Because sometimes people, they do little things they are not aware of and they don't know if they are shirk or not. Yes, they must seek knowledge. Yes, they must learn. But we all are humans and we all make mistakes here and we really need to make lots of istighfar in case any of us is making an act of shirk. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives anything to anyone apart from shirk. And uh, there are many hadiths where uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like in Al-Bukhari, Muslim, of that man who never did any good. And he even denied the decree and predestination and asked his kids to burn him. And again, this talk is on my uh, YouTube channel, Islam Pep Talk, about the guy uh, who asked to be cremated because he was scared of Allah. And even that man who stood up in front of Allah didn't do any act of goodness at all, asked to be cremated. And even told his children that uh, make sure you bear me to the ground so that Allah cannot resurrect me. And even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected him, he told him, why did you do that? He said, because I was scared of you. 
Allah forgave him and put him in Jannah. This is one of the great ahadith that has caused a lot of scratching for the, our scholars. So it's worth going on YouTube and listen to this talk as well. So here, my dear brothers and my sisters, you be a good Muslim, but at the end of the day, you cannot pinpoint to anyone and tell them you are going to hell fire regardless of who they are, where they are. Leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Work on yourself to make it to Jannah and leave inna ilayna iyabam thumma inna alayna hisabam. It is to Allah that people shall return and it is Allah alone who will judge between people and decide who goes to where. Yes, we can say the people who die on kufr will have, go to hellfire. Yes, we can say that people who die on shirk, association to Allah, will go to hellfire. But you cannot pinpoint to someone and say, you are going to hellfire or you are going to paradise. This is not our job. But then again, this is then what we hear about the whole, this few ayat, is that there are some people in the Jewish community and the Christian community and also in the Muslim community today that are playing with the religious texts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned against them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned them also not to use the religious texts to gain any worldly affairs because that is the eye of the misguided. And that also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, the Christians, the Jews, and also Muslims to come clear and use very specific words that show exactly our intention. So many times, sometimes you can make fun of somebody and you say, oh, that sheikh there, he is the bravest of the shuyukh. And people don't know, do you really mean it or are you making fun of the person? This kind of speech is not permitted in Islam. You must come clean and speak clean. This is what the ayat from 44 until 48 speak about is really, really, really to make sure you don't use Islam to personal gains. We don't put ourselves in shady uh, places or uh, situations where our speech can have more than a meaning. We must not be insulting to whoever teaches us. Subhanallah, today you preach something to people and people call you names and insult you and they label you. You're being Shia and Kafir. It's, it's unbelievable about what people can say on your back and these are difficult times and what we have learned today in Surat An-Nisa can open our eyes to becoming a better people uh, inshallah again this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa if you want to be on my group please do send me a message on whatsapp on 078 8735. Also, if you have any ideas, if you want to have uh, questions, if you agree with something I said, please do let me know. If you disagree, please do let me know. Send me messages. I am always open and very much looking forward to any comments or anything really that you can come up with. Please do spread the knowledge and stick to the word of Allah. Again, I pray to Allah to help us all in on our journey back to Him. وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته